And today we are going to have our event with Eileen Garvin, which I'm thrilled about. Eileen Garvin began her writing career as a freelance writer, writing essays and articles about travel, recreation, con conservation, and small business. This is published in Medium, The Oregon, and Psychology Today. Her memoir entitled How to Be a Sister is about growing up in a large family and specifically the impact her sister, Margaret, who had autism, which made it difficult for her to communicate, um, how her sister had impacted her in her life. How to Be a Sister was an indie next pick and a target book of the month selection. But we are here tonight to talk about The Music of Bees, which is Eileen's first novel and a national bestseller. She was an, which was also an indie next pick. So she's got two indie next picks under her belt. Some, the Music of Bees was a Good Morning America buzz pick, a good housekeeping book club pick, library reads pick, a recommend, and has been recommended by People, The Washington Post, Book Riot, and Bookish, along with many others. And for those of you from Books and Company, um, you know that it's also a staff favorite for both Katrina and Ken, as well as myself, but Katrina and Ken often read very divergent things. So it's kind of cool to have something that pulls us all together. Eileen Garvin was born and raised in Eastern Washington and currently lives in Hood River, Oregon with her husband, a fearless calico cat and a passionate Baja mutt, four chickens and about 60,000 honeybees. So, Tonight, we're going to start um, with Eileen talking a bit about the music of bees and then maybe reading some from the book, too. So I'll hand it on over. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you, Lisa and Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, have a chance to talk to um, Wisconsin readers. Uh, I really appreciate it from my, the far coast. Um, I'm going to read a little bit right here, uh, but just to set it up, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the book um, if you haven't read it yet. Music of Bees tells a story of three lonely strangers who meet by chance on a beekeeping farm in Oregon. Um, there's Alice Holtzman who's 44. Uh, she's working kind of a dead end job at the county and um, she's recently lost her husband and Alice was an introvert before she got married and never expected to get married. So this loss has been particularly hard for her. And she meets Jacob Stevenson, who I'm going to read a little bit about, um, who has the tallest mohawk in the history of Hood River Valley High School. And um, Jacob is just a really wonderful, mouthy, independent punk uh, with a, a future ahead of him in music school. But he has an accident at a high school party, and now he's grappling with his new life in a wheelchair. And I, I don't think that's a spoiler alert because it's kind of on the, the cover flap. Um, our third, uh, uh, the third person in this unlikely trio is um, Harry Stokes, who is sort of a bumbling young guy who trusts the wrong people and makes has made some poor choices and has just gotten out of jail. So the three of the, them meet and connect over the honeybees at Alice's Farm, which is set in Hood River, Oregon, a fictionalized version of the town I live in. So I'm going to read you just the first um, couple of pages of Music of Bees. This is from chapter one. Chapter one, orientation flight. Those who suppose that the new colony consists wholly of young bees, forced to emigrate by the older ones, if they closely examine a new swarm, will find that while some have the ragged wings of age, others are so young as to barely be able to fly. A Practical Treatise on the Hive and the Honeybee, Ella Langstroth, 1878. Jacob Stevenson had the tallest mohawk in the history of Hood River Valley High School. Even before it was listed as an official yearbook record, he was pretty sure about it. In his senior photo, it was a blue black masterpiece that flared up to a height of 16 and a half inches. Well, almost. It was more like 16 and 3 eighths, but close enough to silence any quibblers. Jacob had put six months into growing the spiky mass, which he sculpted into four sections, and it had reached its optimal height right before spring finals last year. On this morning, he surveyed the masterpiece of his hair in the mirror and felt no little satisfaction that he'd managed to maintain it for more than a year now, despite unforeseen challenges. The undeniable truth of a mohawk was that you were always fighting gravity. And at a certain point, you lost. You had to be realistic. The idea was to aim for maximum volume that would hold over an entire day. A fallen mohawk would be a terrible embarrassment, especially for a boy of 18. 
Jacob had experimented with various products to maintain the loft. He tried egg whites, mustache wax, hairspray, and even some adhesive from Woodshop, an unfortunate episode. All that experimenting revealed that a mixture of extra firm sculpting wax and professional grade hairspray was the best choice to sustain that 16 and nearly one, one half inch height of achievement. Noah Katz had taken the official measurement the night of the spring jazz band concert. Both of them had been dressed in the traditional black tuxedos that members of the Hood River Valley High School jazz band had been wearing for the past 20 years. Jacob thought then that his hair contrasted nicely with the powder blue cummerbund and bow tie. He posed with his trumpet as Noah snapped a photo, cackling. The phone dwarfed in his big paw. His cheeks shook as he laughed. Sick Stevenson. Katz was a good-natured lumberjack of a guy. The two had become friends at May Street Elementary in fifth grade band, Jake on trumpet and Noah on trombone. Noah did not have a mohawk. Noah's hair was crazy curly and he referred to it as the situation. Unlike Jacob, he did not need any product to make his hair resist gravity. He grew his curls up and out, chiefly to irritate his mother. Look out, ladies, he crowed, tucking at his curls with one hand so that he resembled a human dandelion in fluff stage. He snapped a selfie. Then they hustled into Noah's truck and sped across town to the high school. They had been late, as usual, and Mr. Schaefer was mad, but their band teacher always seemed to be looking for a reason to yell at the two boys, so it was no big deal. Remembering that night made Jacob smile. He turned his head from right to left. On either side of the mast of hair, he could see bits of stubble on his otherwise cleanly shaven skull. He turned on the faucet and dampened a washcloth under the tepid stream to wet his head. He squirted a soft puff of shaving cream into his hand and patted it on the stubble. The lemony white foam smelled institutional, like the hospital, and it made him feel slightly nauseated. He breathed through his mouth and picked up his razor. A mohawk took discipline. He had to wash or at least wet his hair, then comb it out, apply wax to the wet mop, part it into sections, and dry it with the high power blow dry dryer before spraying it into place and then shaving the stubble. The process made him sweat on warm days like this one. It was a big investment of time, really, but that was cool. These days, he had nothing but time. Two hours to do his hair was no problem at all. The reality of that hit him like a punch in the throat as it often did when he sat in front of the bathroom mirror in the morning. The dark little hairs on his scalp poked through the white lather, standing up unwaveringly while Jacob Stevenson, or Jake, as everyone but his parents called him, could not. Jake swallowed hard. It seemed so stupid, the mohawk itself and the mohawk record, considering that in addition to having the tallest mohawk in, Hood, in the history of Hood River Valley High School, he was probably also the only kid there who'd ever had one in this farm town, which was short on punk and big on rodeo. It was also stupid because he no longer went to school there, having sort of graduated last spring, but mostly it seemed stupid because it was pretty much all he had to do on a given day, fix his damn hair. Now that the doctor's appointments had tapered off and his physical therapy was down to once a month, and he had all the time in the world to face the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And I will stop there. Come back. Ta -da. I managed to do that. <laughs> well, first, I want to thank Lisa because, you know, book, it's so one of the nice things about this is like you'd be off tour, and we're so grateful for you. Like, we we think this is a good time to do events because people don't think about it, but people are thinking about gifts. But what? It's a book that sort of slipped by me. And despite its buzz, I had to put that thought in really fast. <laughs> and, um, and it's just been such a delight. And um, I I had so many, uh, you know, what works on so many different levels. And, and the thing is that Oregon, there is, you know, the, you wouldn't have to make too many changes to this book to be Make it Wisconsin. Though, <laughs> distinctive. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of Wisconsin there. And in fact, there's a, you just told, you told us before, there's a lot of Wisconsinites in the River Valley. There, <laughs> there are many, many. There's a Green Bay Packer football <laughs> club. And I'm not into football, but I've always been kind of jealous because they have good parties. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, especially when they're winning, anybody can be a Packer fan. Um, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the Milwaukee, Oregon is named after Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And, but it's spelled differently, right? Because they didn't have standardized spelling when it was. Okay, okay. So, I, didn't, I didn't know that, but I know where it is because I used to write about it all the time for 
my travel and tourism stuff. And every time I'd spell it wrong because it's I E. Right. I don't spell it wrong. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> but I spell a kind of walk wrong now. Because oh. I look for the walkie at the end. <laughs> <laughs> we invented that, by the way. Um, would you like to tell us about like the or? I mean, I, we do know from your bio that you keep these, but would you like to tell about the um, inspiration for the book? Uh, sure. Um, about the bees or the book itself? The what? book itself. Or the, book itself, the, bee, sure. the bees yeah. and, first and then the book. Yeah, like, and they're okay. kind of, they are kind of related. So I got into honeybees in 2014. I thought that it would be less trouble than chickens to tend to something. And I now have chickens, but anyway, oh so I got, I, I've been keeping bees for a couple of years. And, uh, and the, so the book actually started on a very specific day when I was going to pick up a new, um, new nucleus of bees um, uh, in the Hood River Valley. And um, I was driving out of town. My hive had died the year before, which is sad, but so I'm, I was, it was springtime and I was repurposed. I was restarting my hive. And so it's a beautiful spring night. It's, it's April, it's warm out. The, the orchards are blooming and I'm spaced out and I'm driving along out of town. And I am passed um, on Tucker Road and I'm passed by this young man in a wheelchair with this tremendous Mohawk. And it really stopped me because it's a small town and I would have noticed, I would think someone, A, with a mohawk and B, in a wheelchair, um, but I'd never seen him before. And I was struck by how, how fit he looked. Um, we're a pretty sporty town. And I just remember we kind of passed each other. And then the idea, the first line just jumped into my, my mind. And I know that, you know, you probably have lots of writers say that, that kind of inspiration comes from a weird place. And you just, if you're smart, you pull over and write it down because otherwise you, you're not going to remember it. So I did that and went and picked up the bees and then drove home and um, thought, okay, I have to do something with this, this line, this storyline. And I got up the next morning and my dog, who's the fierce, uh, the, the fierce Baja Mutt, what do I call her? What did I, uh, what did you, what did you call her, Lisa? Uh, passionate Baja Mutt. She has, a lot of, she has a lot of big feelings. <laughs> she's, she's a really sweet dog lots of trouble she was like the most expensive free dog that you've ever met so she was recovering from her first acl surgery and i had to keep her in this little pen and she was a puppy it was really hard and so i was like okay this is what i'm doing for the first especially the first um like four weeks i just sat with her a lot and i worked in the book and i just it gave me an excuse to sit there with her and um i started with that sentence and then jacob revealed himself and that's sort of how um, the story began and I just followed it from there. Go Lisa, ahead. you have something to say, I know. Well, I just wanted to say that bees are the new starter chicken, but um, <laughs> I'm gonna pass to Lisa. Well, they're, they're maybe a little bit easier because you don't have like the raccoons and the foxes to go after. Yeah, they, yeah. I think they are, they are easier. And also because in, you know, they're not native to North America, but the way we all keep bees, and I know Wisconsin's a big beekeeping um, uh, state, they, they go dormant in the winter. You know, they're, they're, they're not asleep, but they're clustered. And so really the beekeeping year runs from really April through October. So unlike the chickens who are going to be no end of worry, you know, <laughs> winter long with the, the raccoons. And is it too cold? Do they need their heater on? And, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it is, but I, I don't know, jury's out on which ones are easier to keep alive. Um, so far, so good. All right. We'll have to, the, when the chicken book comes out, we'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was really taken by the characters of both of the boys. So it is nice to see that it was an inspiration from somebody that existed. Did you eventually figure out who it was? No, I, I don't know who it is. I have a lead. I, I, I did a book club in Hood River and I need to circle back to them because um, it sounds like there somebody knew this guy that, that fit the, the description and he was actually a, a veteran. Um, so that would make sense so that if he was a very, very fit. So I need to track him down. I haven't. Um, and I sort of expected him to come to me, you know, I, there, again, like it's a small town. You'd think that by now someone who read the book would say, hey, I think that's you. But so far, I know I, I don't know him. So what was the inspiration for the boys? Um, I really was struck by them and their their internal life and how you wrote about them. We don't often see characters, boy, male characters of that age 
in with such tenderness internal lives like that oh well thank you for saying it like that i really loved them um yeah. and i don't i don't have you know i don't know these two and i don't have kids myself um but i think that harry and jacob probably were inspired a lot by um i have two brothers they're I have four siblings and we were all born within five years. So we're quite close. And my brothers and I are the, like the, the, the caboose. Um, and we're very close and always have been. And I, I, when I was like a little kid, I, I mean, I joked that I was like the third son because that's what my father treated me like one of the boys. So I've always been close to them. I was always close to their friends. I've always had lots of male friends. And so I, I think Harry and Jake both came from that. And in particular, you know, I, I think we all had friends in high school that that boy that just couldn't get along with his dad. And, you know, there was just that there's that friction between fathers and sons. And so maybe they end up, you know, getting kicked out or leaving and then being sort of raised by the neighbor, you know, like a stray. And, and so it, it felt very, very um, believable to me. And um, I, I suppose that's where the, the two of them are are kind of from my past. And they just had such, yeah, I was going to say, they just had such tenderness with each other and about everything. And, it, you know, I recognize that in my son's friends. And I was sort of taken aback by this sort of the puppy pile of, of, yeah. Nice <laughs> yeah. you know. and yet they're so different from each other. Yeah. That's what they I are. thought was really interesting. It's like that you, you wrote them so, you know, distinct. And, and so I just, it was so nice to see the way that they slowly were able to bond with each other. You know, it was a very touching friendship. Yeah, I wasn't that sure was how that would happen. I knew the way it started, all I knew is that Jake would, uh, would um, resent Harry because he was being hired to do this job that now he's fallen in love with, you know, he can't get hired. He can't do this job. He doesn't have the physical capability. And so Harry gets hired. And so the moment that I, I don't want to, I, oops, I should watch what I say. I don't want to do any spoilers, but, but there's, there, you know, there's, it's, and they, they help each other. And when those, the ways that they helped each other revealed themselves to me, I was so pleased. I was like, oh, you guys are the best. <laughs> 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 and, you know, I mean, um, men in our, boy, men and boys in our country are not encouraged to be vulnerable and kind and, you know, I don't know. I, th there's something in that that to me too. And um, you you mentioned earlier when we were chatting in the intro, Jay Ryan Stradall and I were went, did an event together, and he asked me on two different occasions. He said that he was um, he was wondering about the kiteboarding, which is also in there, and I won't say too much about that. But and 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 the relationship that happened there with Harry and somebody else, and that's part of it too. I, kiteboarding is a it's um it's a sport that takes you can have all walks of life. You can have a grandma and then you can have someone who's doing the craziest tricks and they can actually sit down and have a beer together and, and talk about this. They're all doing it on their own level, but it, it kind of is, it unites people. So um, that, that was kind of in the mix. I felt that that's also part of Hood River and it felt like uh, it worked to me. And you are a kite boarder, aren't you? I am, I am a kite boarder. Yes, I'm not the best. But I'm not, I'm not one of the crazy trick doers, but I do enjoy it. <laughs> so you're, are you somewhere, somewhere between the grandma yes. and the muscled? Yeah, well, yogi. there's some, there's some grandmas out here that are pretty. Oh, you're not yeah, at the grandma I level yet. Say that. I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> with my friends now, but yeah, I'm like, I'm a, I, everything I do, I, I mountain bike and I do all that stuff, but I'm not like, I don't like to crash. I don't like to hurt myself. And so I, I'm a very safe kiteboarder. <laughs> well, I I just looked up the Milwaukee kiteboarding, and um, apparently you can you can kiteboard about three blocks from the store or about three right? blocks from my house. So Bradford Beach and Bayview Park. So <laughs> and that Milwaukee. doesn't. I wondered about that. That doesn't surprise me because you have the lake right there, and um, I wondered what that. I wonder what that is. Is it cold? Is it really? Is the water really cold? Mm -hmm. You're probably wearing a wetsuit most yeah. of the year. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, maybe I'll have to come out there and check it out. Mm, that's <laughs> and you right. can bring your We're surfboard. We're gonna woo you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bring the surfboard and go up north to Sheboygan, and you can surf up that way too. 
Oh, that sounds fun. I would love to get out to the Midwest. I was looking at the map to kind of figure out where you all are in relation to each other and um, lots to explore. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if, you know, if you wanted to someday plot a tour for one of your future books, we're very close to Chicago, we're very close to Madison, and then people often add in Minneapolis. It's, you know, it's a bit of a haul, but it's a good market. And yeah. there's nothing else, there ain't nothing else close. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Minneapolis, we're the closest we get. <laughs> yeah, I was actually surprised at how close all the towns are. I didn't really, my pardon, my my geography isn't the best, but I was really surprised at how close uh, Chicago and South Bend and and all those, those towns are. So yeah. Um, how odd that you had mentioned South Bend because we're. I was booking. I was booking a South Bend author today who's not coming. Is doing oh. virtual. Um, oh. But what? you know, whatever. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I love found family novels. I mean, I love them and I'm predisposed to love them. And this is one of my favorites. Um, my, what's so interesting to me is how much the genre has morphed because when I was young, they were almost always about, um, and maybe that was just me, was often the LGBT community because we didn't always have family, mm -hmm. but you've really taken it to another level and shown how um, everybody needs a found family. I also love how you put, no, I don't, you have three wonderful characters and they are a triangle of delight, but um, I feel like the mom's at the center. And usually a found family story is from the perspective of a sibling or a child. And I was wondering if you thought about that, if you'd had some models or, you know, you'd thought about other books like that or. Oh, you mean that I put, that I put Alice in the middle of it? Yeah. Um, no, I didn't, I, I didn't, that just sort of happened naturally, actually, my original intention was, um, I love books, I love novels with multiple point of view, and I expected each one of them to carry an equal weight, and I was very frustrated to discover that didn't happen, so, you know, if you, if you stand back and look at it, Alice really carries the majority of the chapters, and then Jacob, and then Harry, and, um, I also recently discovered during COVID um, that I'm not type A. I thought I was a type A personality, which makes me laugh now to realize like, of course you're not. But um, but I really, there, but in my mind, like that fits into that category. I really wanted it to be this nice, tidy, you know, three person thing and it just wasn't happening. And I think um, it just, it ended up, the way it ended up, I didn't have any models for it. I think maybe Alice naturally as the, as kind of the mama bear and the person with more experience in life, um, she she just had more more work to do. Well, not to give anything away to folks, but the environmental the environmental narrative is more her narrative too. Mm -hmm. Right. She grew up in a farming family. She's lived in Hood River her whole life. And while I, you know, I will, a lot of people have heard of Hood River because of the kiteboarding and the sportiness, our economy really rests on the orchards. We, we um, produce more pears than any other state in the country. And uh, so that's, that's part of the, the under narrative there. And it was so successful at being that environmental novel where you, you kept that balance. You didn't get preachy, you kept that, um, learning and curiosity there, which I really appreciated being passionate for everything you were writing about. It was like the novel you could hand to somebody and say, here, here's something, read this and then tell me what you think. <laughs> Thanks, I'm glad it wasn't too preachy. And that's, um, I think maybe reflective of, uh, you know, this, this is a fictionalized version of my town. Some things are true, like you'll see Wacoma bookstores included in, in the mention and, and some, of the, some of the names are, of streets and things are the same, but the, the way that everybody kind of like bumps into each other around town, that's, that's the way it is in Hood River. And so with the environmental part that I won't give away too much either, but it felt more, it's not like there's a good guy and a bad guy. It's not like, you know, you can take, you know, well, okay. But I mean, <laughs> in a, a small town is like a big family, right? Where you have the, this economy, as I just mentioned, that and, and, and the environmental stuff isn't based specifically on anything that happened in our town, but you have to find a way, like how do, you, how do we manage to keep feeding the country and yet not 
continuing to decimate the environment, right? That's a pretty core question at the heart of our daily lives. And when we're, we're all at the grocery store sort of, you know, having a, a existential moment, trying to pick out the right container of whatever, because it's everything's so loaded. So I, I think what you're suggesting, Lisa, is that you can, you can give it to people as a conversation starter about yeah. those things. And that's why I feel like it's a, a appealed to people because no matter where you live, you've seen a honeybee. You know, you, if you, even if you live in an apartment, you've been to the park, you, you, know, you have a park near you, 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 if you were ever a child, you liked honey. So it's an easy in for people to stop and think like, oh, honeybees. Wow. So, the, you know, what's their deal? Oh, they, you know, they only live six weeks and here are the environmental threats to them and, you know, uh, things like that. I think it's a, it's a great place to start the conversation. And so many, you know, hive collapse has been in the news for a number of years now. So, mm -hmm. um, not always connected the as clearly as in your book, but good. <laughs> Lisa. But maybe it should have been connected right, exactly. more clearly. <laughs> I feel like I, you know, read some articles that weren't, didn't spell things out as well as they probably should have. Yeah, yeah. Would you like to talk? Of, we're three introverts talking, are we? Yes. And we were like, we were, we, Lisa and I really love the book Leonard and Hungry Paul, which is sort of about the power of introverts. And I really thought that this book actually was a great companion to that book um, in that it, um, and it's only, you only get to be its companion because I read that one first. Oh. But um, <laughs> otherwise, it would be a great companion to you. Um, but, um, I, you know, one of the things I, you know, I guess you would say that Jake is maybe a little a more of a people person, but certainly not Alice or Harry. And, um, no, I love, and, and I love the power that comes from their quietude. Thank you. Them. What was the name of the, what was the title you, you said? I, I didn't hear it. Leonard and Hungry Paul. So Leonard. came out last year. Lisa and I both love it. Um, it, it's about two Irish gentlemen in their thirties and one of them wants a girlfriend and one of them wants a job and that's the plot. Oh, um, that's my kind of book. <laughs> but it is so <laughs> delightful and mm -hmm. so, and it's almost like it's all in little episodes and, yeah. um, and, um, and it is very much like how these quiet people, um, get heard. And it's also about sort of uh, a, a, another book that um, really values kindness, which mm -hmm. of course your book does as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that. And I, I love to read that. And I, um, so yeah, Alice, definitely, it's funny. Um, some, some people have said um, in, a, in a sort of blatant way, book clubs will say like, that she's such an outsider, such a weirdo. <laughs> they like, Actually, I don't know. She seems pretty normal to me. But um, Alice, you know, the whole introvert, extrovert thing came to my attention quite recently. Again, like uh, like I was saying about thinking I was type A, I also was under the misperception that I was an extrovert for many years. And that's partially to do with um, the way we were raised. Um, we were talking earlier about my sister, Margaret, and Margaret's, uh, Mar my sister, Margaret, was diagnosed with autism when I like the month I was born. So I never knew any life without her. And it, she was born in a time when it just, nobody knew what, it, what autism was. Like I would say as a four-year-old, I'd say my sister's autistic and the neighbor would say, oh, you mean artistic, don't you sweetie? Like nobody knew what it was or why she was doing what she was doing. And she had very, you know, volatile behavior. And some of it was very, very funny and some of it was not. Um, and I, so I was always, because I was her younger sister and talk about gender roles, I was, I was her care, you know, I was helping take care of her. My brothers who were close to me in age were not like they, and to this day, like when we do stuff together, I'm sort of like doing, you know, I'm helping Margaret out. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not bashing my brothers. It's just the way it happened. And so for years, <laughs> for years, I was always like trying to get out in front of like whatever thing she was going to do. And so I see, seemed very comfortable in social situations. And I, I wrote an essay um, about for introvert. I don't know if you guys know that website, introvertbeer.com. It's lovely. I wrote an essay for them about how as a, uh, I'm a performer, you know, just amateur musician. 
And I've never had stage fright because when I was a kid, I would be on stage waiting for my sister to do something in the audience and like detract attention from the choir by something she was doing. And so I, I discovered a book in 2014, Susan Cain's book, Quiet, uh, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And it, it changed my life. And, you know, I, I feel like I am the, I'm the, for better, for worse, I've become the extrovert or the introvert evangelist for anyone who knows me. And it's, um, I don't know if you've all, you both have always been out with your introversion, but I find that people respond really positively. And it's like, you give them permission to not, to stop doing things they don't want to do because they're trying to, you know, fulfill expectations or something. Um, have you had that experience? I, people always think I'm extroverted and I was obsessed with the uh, Myers-Briggs stuff in, the, in its day. And it was like, mm, no, I mean, it's, it's cause a lot of it is we all, every introvert has to learn to be extroverted. Mm -hmm. Like I can't run a bookstore as an introvert, you right. know, right. I couldn't do it. I had yeah. to, it's like, this is my job. Yeah. But yeah. you know, I'm not comfortable at parties and I'm not comfortable, you know, like I like one person at a time, maybe two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and a counter, a counter or a book in front of me. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, yeah. And what, what's my best day is staying home and reading. Yeah. yeah. Or out in the garden for me. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. What about you, Lisa? Well, no, I mean, I, I think I've sort of struggled that way because you are as a, as a bookseller out in front of people and you appear comfortable, but put me in a party and I'm in the corner. So unless it's one person and then it's an easy thing to have a conversation right. with. Yeah. So I don't go to um, the party. So <laughs> I've avoided them too for most of my life. So, um, but I think though, what another part of the book I really appreciated was seeing the characters work through their own spaces to finally come into a place that is somewhat safe that they can all three of them reflect back on whether it's their mostly it's their grief but also just how they are in the world and the choices that they can make and to see that conversation inside of their heads and those actions it was so nice to see that in fiction because you could see you know it's like an example of how with when we try things can actually work mm -hmm. things can go wrong but we can see how things work so I, I really uh thank you for saying that and I I that's how I I felt about when I realized I was starting out the book with them all three of them kind of at their, their low point in their lives to date and and in, in a way it was it was easier than having to write like if I'd started when when Alice before Alice's husband died that would have been harder. So maybe I was taking an easy route, but it, it made me, you know, that all three of them are at a point that they have to do something different. Like Jacob's problem is the most obvious and, the, and, and his life is the, is the clearly the mo is the most changed in sort of practical terms, but each one of them has a problem an obstacle. And that's the way our lives are. You know, I would say when I wrote how to be a sister, I was trying to understand what, what I, how to be a sister. I was trying to understand how I was supposed to just be Margaret's sister instead of feeling so responsible for her for the rest of my life. That's one example. We all have things we're grappling with. Um, and as we, and it occurred to me as I was writing them, I'm like, oh, okay, Alice, Alice has had this relationship thing happen or this, you know, this, this major grief, but it happens to all of us all the time. And it's not just one thing. And they each have to find an answer in themselves. When you're lucky that happens when you're really when you're lucky that it doesn't always happen right i mean and and even better if you can be around people that support that you're you're in luck and you know alice for example she's not touchy-feely like she doesn't they mean so much to her but she's not going to say that and i and i loved that about her because that's just the way she that's the way it worked for her i love that you talk about, I love you thinking about like, where are you going to start your characters? Like, are you going to show the, de the, 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 the decline and then the rise? Or are you going to do it? And I mean, it works so well in this book. And then, 
But I was just thinking about another book that Lisa and I liked, Early Morning Riser. Did you ever read that one? No, I didn't. Um, so good. <laughs> yeah, it's a gonna... little goofier than your book, but <laughs> yeah. it's still about grief. And yeah. it's still, and in that one, she chose to have the things happen. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so, it's so, now I feel like I have to grab the arcs of all the books I read. So thank you for that. Yeah. I'm like, this is a new exciting thing to do with a book. Yeah, yeah. Lisa was also talking about, was going to talk to you about um, food in the book. Oh, yeah. I just love the, um, the way the food was woven in because it, it, you have to feed the bees and, and the bees are always out looking and foraging for food, but food becomes a way of holding everybody together um, in the household because Jake needs to find a reason to stay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. And just how, and then also the bees pollinate our, our crops, which create our food and we need to like, you know, take care of all these things. So you did such a nice job pulling that together. Now, when you, did you plot all of those out or does it just come naturally from how you see the world and the stories you tell? You no, know, I actually hadn't even thought of it until you said that. <laughs> and because you, when we were talking about recipes earlier, I love to cook and I did so much travel writing about Oregon, like culinary stuff that, that, that's, that was an outgrowth, but, um, Thank you for pointing out this lovely theme in my story. And no, I think it was it was very natural. I mean, it started out with, okay, yes, it's a it's a, it solves a problem. What is Jacob going to contribute, right? So what what can he do? And that really springs from like, well, I'll talk about that later. I'll just answer your food question. Um, so what can Jacob do, right? So he has this physical difference now, but it doesn't mean that he can't contribute in meaningful ways. And so the food thing was that you like, how am I going to, how am I going to let Alice, she's like, how, how is he going to get to stay there? So this is a practical offering, right? We all have to eat. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, she's been eating like crap because she's depressed and living alone. And we've all been there where we're like eating the wrong stuff and it makes you feel terrible. It doesn't help the problem. And so it's, you know, I don't care how grumpy you are. If someone start, if you've been eating over the sink for a year and then someone starts making you good food, you know, you're going to probably feel a little bit of warmth toward them. And then Harry, I love I think that also just kind of happened. He's hungry all the time. You know, he's broke and he's hungry all the time. And so that was like, um, it, it wasn't plotted, but has come, it came together quite nicely. <laughs> We agree. We, I mean, there were even little moments where the bees were learning too. Like you, I, I mean, that goes back to one of the things we both really liked about the book, which was the chapter framing with the bees um, behavior. I mean, so much to learn. Um, and, but also, and such a commentary on society. So um, is the, somebody asked what the website is, the introvert website. Is it introvert deer? Introvertdeer.com. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I wanted to double check before I send it out to people. And somebody was just talking about apps that they enjoyed the sounds in the book. Um, and whether it's the musical note that the queen bee emits, Alice keening and grief are Cheney barking with delight. All the sounds added so much to the book. And it's true. It was a very audible book. Thank you for, for saying that. I, I am very um, into sound and I'm sound sensitive, which I think a lot of introverts are. Uh, and, and I, um, like I'm a, I'm a bird, I'm a bird listener. <laughs> um, I, I love bird watching, but I don't see, I, so I can't see them. Like I'm terrible with binoculars. I can't quite figure out binoculars. So th there's this new app called Merlin that the, um, Cornell has put out. I don't know if any of you used it, but you can capture the sound and then it tells you what the bird is. So anyway, I'm, I'm very into, to sounds and, um, I loved the, uh, the, the, an incident of the queen bee making that G sharp or A flat is actually factual. And I came across that in the way that you do when you're, I was, you know, reading a lot about bee stuff and I have this um, book, I can't remember the name of it, but it's just sort of a random collection of like historic bee art and facts about, you know, beekeeping, official beekeeping or formal beekeeping got it started in Egypt. And so all that kind of thing and little, little stories, uh, fables from different countries. And it was just this little sidebar that mentioned that 
that is that the G sharp. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so I Googled it and did a little reading and it is, um, it's a real thing. And I thought, well, I can play with that because Jacob's also a musician. So how can I kind of like yeah. bring that into the story? And there was so much music and how you, how did you decide to go with the, the um, classic California punk and the ska? Well, you know, because he was just so, he was so bent on being different. And, mm -hmm. and it is, as, as I saw with maybe friends in high school, it's really, it's an attitude. It's not really about the music because J, J, punk isn't that melodic. <laughs> <laughs> and he clearly loves to play his instrument. He, yeah. he and that's this kind of, kind of soft part of him that we find out about, but it's all posturing, you know, the hair and the outfits. And it's just like kind of a screw you to his dad, really like, and I'm going to be, I'm going to stand out and look different. And so the, the, and I, I do like ska. I don't, punk's a little too noisy for me, but, um, that's yeah, like the more just, melodic version of punk, you know, yeah. it's like yeah. just as rebellious, but you can hum it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and it's great. And that works. And it's also, you know, it's the, it's the thing he does with his friends. Like he and Noah play together, you know, and there's that, that connection. So um, that's, that's really, it, it was a lot of facade. I just want to say it's very odd that I, I, I follow this music website called number ones and Today's was not, had nothing to do with it, but I, I get bored. Yeah, I've read them all, but I like to go back and I was reading the Cats in the Cradle um, essay and it was like, um, there was this whole, in the comments, it became this Cats in the Cradle by Harry Chapin versus Father of Mine by Everclear. And then somebody brought in, there's a punk version of Cats in the Cradle. I was like, oh, that's, of course. that's a punk. <laughs> that would definitely tie into this. Um, so um, I wish I could play it for people now. I wasn't prepared. Well, there's a couple really great videos on, well, I'm sure there's lots, but I heard of the chirping um, queen. Yeah. The yeah. honey queen making the little chirping sound. So I've got, I can, we can post them later or if okay. anybody wants to go out and just look at those, watch some of those videos. The sounds are amazing. And, and I also, I should say, um, part of, uh, people might find this when they go to look. Um, a, lo a lot of the time that you hear that sound, it's when there are multiple queens hatching. So the uh -huh. older queen has failed or is dying. The worker bees decide, hey, we need, we need a new queen. Things are getting kind of lousy around here. So they feed the, the eggs in a certain way and, over and gestate them so that the queen's will hatch, but they, they want to make sure they they want to make sure that they get one, you know, one that work with that's hardy. So they lay several and whoever hatches first starts making that sound. Um, it's called tooting or quacking. They start making that G sharp sound to go find the other Queens to murder them <laughs> before they <laughs> hatch. So it's very medieval, but that's, that's the first thing I came across. And I thought, I'm not going to put that in the book. That's a little bit dark, but you know, it's all about survival and you can only have one queen. So they, that's, that's kind of how they, that's how they manage that. Huh. I was put the video in and of course the commercial came up and I was like trying to mute it and it wasn't working. So I apologize <laughs> for that. But I love the idea of the Game of Thrones yeah. nature <laughs> documentary. Right. Well, and, and when you get it, if you get a, a new queen, like let's say your queen has died and your bees didn't make one. If she comes in a little cage and she has attendants with her because she can't do anything for herself. She can't feed herself. She can't clean herself. So it is very royal. Um, and that she has these other, these worker bees hanging out in there with her in, until um, from the opposing sides, the, her attendants and the new worker bees eat this sugar cap away. And by that time they've accepted her as their queen, they accept her pheromone. But it, it is very, um, you know, you could write a play of, of the whole thing. And will we see that coming from you? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> Accompanied by ukuleles? <laughs> Maybe, yeah, some like multiverse ballad about the fight in the hive, perhaps. <laughs> An opera, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I was curious about, you've, you've done so many different things and I was curious about some of them and how you felt they might've affected your writing. I know 
unlike a lot of writers. You were an editor. You did a lot of editing. How, how did that affect writing the book? I think um, editing made me a good writer. And I got a job as an editor before I ever had a job as a writer. I did everything backwards. I didn't, I didn't take writing classes. I didn't get an MFA. I didn't go to journalism school. I just kind of like fumbled my way along. And I, and I fell into this job in Albuquerque as a managing editor for a weekly newspaper. Yeah. And um, I that my, my, pardon me? I'm from Albuquerque. Lisa's from Albuquerque. <laughs> Love Albuquerque. I lived there for seven, almost eight years, and I worked for New Mexico Business Weekly, um, and which you know is a backwards. I should have been a reporter and worked my way up. But anyway, I had a master's degree in English. I got this job, and so I was reading the work of very experienced reporters and then brand new writers. And so, and I had to kind of like manage it all. Um, that was a great training. I also was a, an English teacher while I was doing my master's. So I read a lot of student essays. And so by the time I became, started writing freelance and then also my memoir and the novel, I had some pretty, um, I wouldn't say that I'm thick skinned, that's a stretch, but I just take for granted that editing happens, right? So I knew I wanted my work to be as clean as it could be. So I could look at it with an editor's eye and I run my, any draft I'm working on, whether it's an essay or a chapter, I run it through the same process that I would an article that I'm turning in that someone's paying me for out of newspaper. And it just, it feels very natural. And I, and it's part of the like, the like tedium that I love about the writing process. And so I think it served me well in the sense that Publishing is so hard to get anyone's attention and you really have to have your act together. So the more polished you can have something, the better off you're gonna be. And I think, so I think it served me in that way. Wanted to make sure we talk, have, we have a few questions. One was um, from Zoom user, as opposed to other Zoom user, who wanted to know um, what was the, who was the hardest character? The hardest character to write. Um, I think Jake was the hardest character to write because I wanted to be really careful and respectful. I don't use a wheelchair. I don't live with anybody who uses a wheelchair. And I wrote him from, I wrote him from the my heart, the way I think about my sister. Like my whole childhood, the question about Margaret was always, what's the best, like how how can she be most independent? How can we make her life as good as it can be? And so that's what Jacob is asking himself. That's what his mother is asking. And so I felt like it, it, that sprang from a very natural place, but I also wanted to do due diligence to make sure that I was honoring the um, experience of someone who was using a wheelchair. And I learned a lot in that process of the, the interviews that I did with people and the reading that I did. And it's really made me look at my town differently. Hood River is not a friendly, it's not an ADA friendly town. Um, and also just really opened my eyes to the idea of universal design because every single one of us is going to be disabled at some point in our lives, whether we're, you know, in a wheelchair or we're old or we're injured or we're pregnant or whatever it might be, or we just have a kid in a stroller we're pushing, we could all benefit from the sort of sidewalks and ramps and parking and just attention to, um, to other ways of being ambulatory. So I think that was the one I was the most um, vigilant about Jake's mm -hmm. character. Yeah, we we both thought he was, we thought, oh, she must have had a lot of sensitivity readers because he just, yeah. he just feels so true. And so, you know, I, and there were so many wonderful, I, I love how he looks around and sees what works, and what, what doesn't for, for his, um, his life in terms of resetting up her house, for example. Yeah, yeah. And he's young and, and, and motivated too. But I, you know, I had some very, very basic advice from some terrific people. Um, you know, just don't, that people that use wheelchairs, like don't, you know, don't fall into this trope of making someone helpless. And of course, like an 18 year old, one of the first people I talked to said, you know, pe people make a choice early on, they're going to be bitter, or they're going to move on. Jake was clearly moving on and he's young enough and motivated enough that he wants things still. And so it seemed to me that it worked that he would be evaluating, what can I do and how can I do it? He didn't want to be, I mean, he really wants to get out of his parents' house for one thing. That's a big motivation 
for any teenage boy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, did you have another question, Daniel, or can I pop in? No, go, please. I was meeting with one of my publisher reps this morning and we were talking about the fall list and there's a book called Heartbreak, um, a personal and scientific journey, I think is the full title. And he was, you know, talking to me about it and how I'd really like it. And he said, but the one thing that he took away from it was this line of the antidote to loneliness isn't companionship, it's purpose. Oh, I love that. I yeah. too, and I thought, did you just give this to me because of this conversation today? Because it fits <laughs> so well with it what does. the characters figure out. Is this, you know, the companionship is one thing, but each one of them discover a purpose. Mm -hmm. And well, you, that's that's the introverts did you know that right that's that's the that's a perfect um mission for an introvert like if you're if you're lonely being around other people isn't necessarily sometimes it's worse yeah. so yeah and i think you know i of course i read man's search for meaning and i think that especially in the world we live in with everything being so high tech and we are disconnected from people finding a way to not feel lonely finding purpose finding a way to connect with people feels like a pretty uh, relevant quest i suppose and a perfect one now too this book rings so true or the time is such a nice timing to come out during covid where we're struggling with all this stuff and we need hope and the book offers so much hope Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 that makes me happy. I was actually surprised. I read a lot of dark fiction and I was <laughs> like, oh, I wrote a happy book. Who knew? <laughs> People don't always write the book that they read. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's true. Um, Lisa, was the book that you were referring to the Florence Williams book coming out? Yes, is it is. Oh, yeah. Exactly. All right. yeah. I'm, I have it in the, um, in the uh, chat for folks. Um, you know, if you see something you like and you're in, look in the chat, if you click on these, it'll open in new pages and you can keep them there after the event ends, including purchasing the book from one of us or your favorite independent bookstore. Um, we both have book clubs too, which is exciting. Yeah. We, uh, Lisa was, um, do you have another question before we go into asking our author what she's been reading? I don't think I do. I'm going to run through mine real quick. Um, no, but not without opening up a larger discussion. That's right. We either we need seven <laughs> more hours with you, or like ten more hours. So. Thank you. you. Guys are great. <laughs> um, well, before I give you my recommendation, um, I, I'm realizing it's getting really dark in here. The sun just set, so I hope you can I say the sun just set. It's just moody. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like we should have done this a couple of days ago. Um, Florence Williams' book, The Nature Fix, is is terrific too, uh, and it's it's kind of um, I think people that are interested in the environment and um, the impact on our our on human connection, happiness. It's it's a terrific read, and I'm very excited about her new one. So yeah. um, I read like you all probably do. I I make myself a little bit nuts. I have to. I like to read different things because I like to write different things. I write nonfiction. I write fiction. I don't write poetry, but I love to read poetry. And so I've always kind of got several things going um, for a big, yeah, kind of a big juicy novel I just finished, um, Ruth Ezeki's um, The Book of Form and Emptiness. Am I getting the title right? Mm -hmm. Yes, The Book of Form and Emptiness, which has a library in its center and and and, and a book. It's, it's really terrific. It's long. So it's one of those when you, you don't want to fast read. Um, I'm also reading um, Joy Harjo, um, U.S. Poet Laureate, her book, I think it came out in 08, it's called She Had Some Horses, um, it's uh, her book of poetry, um, in preparation for, my book club's going to read her first memoir, Crazy Brave, and her, yes. it's just absolutely beautiful, her poetry is amazing, and, and talk about the times that we're in, just it's about, you know, grief and loss and resilience, and she's amazing, she just like, it just makes, stops me. Um, and then I'm also reading Birdology, which is a lovely collection of essays, um, nonfiction essays by Cy Montgomery, who wrote The Soul of the Octopus. And for anyone who's interested in birds, she's got this, it's just a terrific collection of everything from like her, her beloved chickens 
to studying causaways in Australia. I mean, these like 150 pound prehistoric looking things that actually kill people <laughs> and, uh, and everything in between. She's a wonderful um, writer. So those are some things I'm reading right now. And You'll I can't wait to look in the chat for your recommendations. <laughs> You'll enjoy Crazy Brave, and there's a lot of Albuquerque in that story. Oh, yeah, yeah. So she taught at UNM, I think, and I she think she was there like when I wasn't there because I she was she would have been in my department, and I didn't ever have a chance to study with her. She was there when I was at the bookstore, and she would visit the bookstore frequently. So we were at, I worked at Salt of the Earth Books, and it was a great place. Oh yeah, yeah. that's not there anymore, is it? No, uh -uh. it closed in '96. Mm. like yesterday yesterday yeah. <laughs> that's we, how old i am <laughs> just yesterday oh, <laughs> you and me both buddy um lisa and i both really loved a book that came out this year that's very new mexico-y um the five oh, wounds yes. do, you, do you read that oh, by no um, by kristen oh, baldis quaid we oh i lisa, love her stuff yeah. yeah, Lisa yeah. brought out, this is based on one of the stories in Night of the Fiestas, and Lisa brought out all her books about New Mexico <laughs> to show me oh. and give me a little talk about what was going on in the book. It was really good. It's terrific. such a good book. It really is so full of heart and sorrow and hope, too. Oh, and thanks New for Mexico. the recommendation. That yeah. sounds awesome. Yeah, I studied... Um, Chicano literature in the English department at UNM. So it's always had a real uh, real interest for me, that intersection of cultures. Yeah. When were you at UNM? 98, 98 okay. to 2000. Yeah. Okay. Just yesterday. Just yesterday. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I was gone by then. <laughs> right. Yeah, and I never, I never went to Salt of the Earth. So I, I, I'm yeah. sorry I missed that. Um, no, it was a fantastic place. Did you teach, did you take classes from Pat Smith? Patricia Smith? I did, yeah. yeah. yeah I did. Well, we'll talk. Yeah. She's, a, she's an old friend. Oh, yeah. Oh. Cool. How wonderful. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure, Lisa, do you have a last question? I, oh, we've got like no minutes left. I just want I to sit and talk again. I know, like I said, I've got you, lots, but. Yeah, are you mm -hmm. working on something new? We do I, have that I am. Yeah, I am working on something new. I've got a another novel, um, kind of full on into the first draft of it. I don't want to say too much about it, but it's been a lot of fun to write, and it's got more more people with problems, and it's also set in the Pacific Northwest. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. You're making. You're making. Who was that person who asked? What's the next? Oh, what was that person? Somebody was very excited here. I want to give them a shout out. Kevin, thank you for answering <laughs> you, Kevin's Kevin. question. <laughs> I'm excited too. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We are recording. So um, please, um, we will send out the recording to everybody. Uh, please share it with friends who maybe weren't able to join tonight. Um, and um, we're so grateful. Um, looking forward to selling more of your copies at the holidays, both of us, and lots of other independent books. Thank you so much for your time. Thank for you so much for having me. And it uh, looks like I'm about to like disappear into the gloom. No, no, this is a nice dramatic. This is a I'm true afraid. fade out. <laughs> I'm afraid to turn on the lights. I don't know what the light switch is in here. Um, but it was so much. <laughs> sorry, what? <laughs> it was. It was so much fun to talk with you both. Thank you so much for having me. It's really delightful, and I really, as a debut author, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your support.